Oh, yes, he is holy, holy, holy forever. And we have to understand and know and embrace the holiness of God. I've entitled the message this morning, God Wants to Save You. And that's for now and eternity. God wants to save you in the present, and God wants to save you forever. We're in the book of Isaiah as a part of our Immerse Bible reading experience. If you want to know more, you can go to our website under the news section, or you can go to ImmerseBible.com and learn more about that. We're reading through the books of the prophets over an eight-week period. And last week and this coming week, we're reading through the book of Isaiah. So we're loaded today and this next week as we go through half of Isaiah this morning and half of Isaiah this um, next Sunday. And I hope you're reading along with us. You can listen online on that website of ImmerseBible.com under the profit section. You can listen to it. Um, you can also read it there. You can buy a book on Amazon and read it at home or on your Kindle. And um, if you're starting with us today, tomorrow, start reading that second part, week number three in the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah talks about now and then. He talks about what's happening in the middle to late 8th century B.C. in Judah and Israel and Syria, Assyria, the nations around Israel and Judah. He talks about the current situation. He talks about the future, and he also talks about the end of time, the end of the age, the day of the Lord, when all things are consummated. Isaiah's prophecy transcends Isaiah's time and moves to the universal scope of God's people, of sin, salvation, and restoration. So you can almost see the entire teaching of Scripture in this one book. From creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. This is not only a word for Judah and Israel, but it was also a word for the nations of the world in that day. It is also a word for the nations of the world today, for Christians today, and for America today. In their day, they were surrounded by pagan nations. And Isaiah and Amos, Hosea, they prophesied to those pagan nations. But they also spoke to the people of God. So when you're reading this as a Christian here in America or wherever you are, don't just think about it's them, the bad guys, and us, the good guys. That's what Israel thought. That's what Judah thought. But Isaiah was bringing correction to the people of God who had been compromised with the world. So when you think about Israel and Judah and and Ammon and Moab and Edom and Syria and, and the Philistines and Tyre and all those places, think of, if you're a Christian, if you're identified as Christian, think of, well, we got to think of ourselves as the people of God who've gone astray and who compromise with culture, and who need to turn back to God as a people. Yes, there were righteous people in the land of that day, but the leaders and many of the people had turned away from God. And we see the same thing in our nation, in our community, even today. So we begin Isaiah with God's case against Israel. This is a legal thing that's going on. Israel and Judah have broken the covenant. And in Deuteronomy, it laid out the terms of the covenant, but it also laid out what happens when you break the covenant. It's just like the law. We have laws in America. We have laws in Florida. We have laws in Orlando. And those laws are laid out. And when you break the law... There are consequences. It's the same thing with God. When we break God's law, there are consequences. And we can't make up our own laws to overrule or to modify or amend the laws of God. So Isaiah begins in verse number 2, Listen, O heavens. He's calling the heavens to be a witness to this trial. 
to this case. Pay attention, earth. He's calling the earth in this poetical um, prophecy to be witnesses to the case that God is making here, not just against the nations, but against his own people. He says, this is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. The children I have raised and cared for have rebelled against me. You want to understand God? I understand it from the perspective of a parent or of parents who have raised a child and the child has turned into rebellion against the parents and the heartache and the heartbreak that it brings. Yes, there are consequences. But that parent wants that child to be saved. God wants you to be saved. He says, even an ox knows its owner and a donkey recognizes its master's care. But Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. They spurn the care of God and may have looked to other gods. They've looked to themselves, their wealth, their power, their military might to be their provision, to be their, be their care He says, oh, what a sinful nation they are, loaded down with the burden of guilt. You see, when you break God's law, no matter what drug you take or what euphoria you stir up within yourself, there will always be that load, that burden of guilt. And God wants to lift it off of you. There are evil people, corrupt children who have rejected the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. That's the case. That's the judgment. And this judgment, yes, is for Israel and Judah, but it's also for the nations of the world. And we see this in the prophets. They don't only speak to Israel and Judah, but they speak to all the world. Why? Because God is the God of all the world. He's not just the God of Israel or the God of Judah. He is the God of the heavens and the earth and all the peoples of the earth. No matter who you are, where you are, what language you speak, what country you live in, where you come from, what your ethnicity is, God is your God. And you either acknowledge that and worship Him, or you turn from Him and reject Him. In Isaiah 10, 33, it says, But look, the Lord of heaven's armies will chop down that mighty tree of Assyria, with great power. He will cut down the proud, the lofty tree will be brought down again. Assyria was the superpower of their day. We know Egypt was a superpower earlier. Babylon will be the superpower later on. Persia after that. Greece after that. Rome after that. There always are superpowers in the world. And Isaiah is saying the superpower is coming down. It's coming down. Isaiah 14, 26. I have a plan for the whole earth. A hand of judgment upon all the nations. All people have been created by God. Israel is a special possession. Israel has a special role in revealing God, the people through whom the Messiah will come into the world. But in the end, the people of God, as we see in the New Testament, as we see in Revelation, include all the people of all ethnicities, of all lands, of all languages, who've come together in Christ as one people, the people of God. The word of warning, or the word of judgment, is a warning. Hmm. 
It's a warning from, from God to us. In Isaiah 30, 8 through 11, the Bible says, Now go and write down these words. Write them in a book. They will stand until the end of time as a witness. About what? About the rejection of God's word. The warning has come and the people have rejected the warning. And we see in the scripture that over hundreds and hundreds of years, God sends the prophets, God sends his teachers, and the leaders and the people again and again reject that word. It says these people are stubborn rebels who refuse to pay attention to the Lord's instructions. They tell the seers, that's the prophets, or a type of prophet, stop seeing visions. They tell the prophets, don't tell us what is right. Tell us nice things. Tell us lies. And that's what people want. They want preachers to tell them things that they want to hear. They want preachers to tell them things that make them feel good about themselves. And so when you hear prophecy, when you hear judgment, when you hear rebuke and correction, people don't like that. It makes us uncomfortable. It's not desirable. And we're told, don't say that. Or just flip the channel and find somebody who will say what you want them to, want them to say. And you will find them. There are plenty of them out there. You can find the person who will say what you want to hear. Forget all this gloom, they say. Get off your narrow path. Stop telling us about your Holy One of Israel. Don't tell us there's one way. Don't tell us there's a holy way. Don't tell us there's a path that we have to walk following God. We're good people. We're righteous people. We know good from evil. We know right from wrong. And we don't need a prophet from God telling us what is right and what is wrong. But the word of judgment is a word of warning. It's a word of warning. You know, salespeople tell people what they want to hear. Now, you know how that works, right? Right? If you want to sell something to somebody, you've got to convince them that what you have is what they want. All right? Now, you can do that eth ethically and legitimately and rightfully, but in the end, the transaction is going to happen because you've convinced them that you've got something that they want. So people learn to tell people what they want to hear. And you have to hope that they're ethical. But people can manipulate and deceive and lead people down almost any path by telling them what they want to hear. And there are all kinds of salespeople. Not just people selling goods and services. But there are religious salespeople, political salespeople, ideological salespeople, peer group salespeople. All kinds of people trying to get you to follow them. But you know, God doesn't lie or use manipulation or deceit. He speaks straight forward the truth. Why? Because He wants to save you. That's why. He wants to save you. And you got to know that God wants to save you. Now and forever. People are believing and following today's prophets. And we have the prophets out there. The people who speak online, on television, on radio, through the media about right and wrong and truth and ideology and all these things are a form of prophets telling people what to believe, what to think, and how to live. But if they're not speaking from the Word of God, then they're false prophets. The people have sinned. The people of Israel, the people of Judah, the people of all the earth. Last week we saw the primary areas of sin, of idolatry, of putting other gods before God, of unholy and corrupt worship. They still identified as the people of God, as Israel, as Judah, and they followed many of the customs and practices of the covenant. But their hearts were far from God. They practiced injustice. You see the two themes here? These are the two things that Jesus talked about. When he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? 
love God and love people. Idolatry, unholy worship is about loving God. Injustice is about loving people. And that's why Jesus said that all the commands can be summed up with these two. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Don't mistreat them. Don't cheat them. Don't treat them unjustly for your own benefit and your own good. But love mercy. Pursue justice. Sin has consequences in the short term and the long term. And that's what we see in the prophets. There were immediate consequences in Israel and Judah because their neighbors were what? Their neighbors were attacking them, raiding them, overtaking them, and harming them. That was immediate consequences. There are also the immediate consequences of, of losing the blessings and the benefits of God. There are long-term consequences. Israel would go into exile. Judah would go into exile because of their sin. And there are consequences beyond that. And those are the eternal consequences of salvation or judgment and separation from God. And Isaiah and the prophets speak to all of these. But here's the truth. People cannot save themselves. I can't save myself. You can't save yourself. Humanity can't save itself. Our leaders can't save us. Only God can save us. Only God can save us. Isaiah 29, 13 says this, So the Lord says, These people say they are mine. This is what we as Christians, this is what we as people in America and in the West who see have a Christian heritage, these people say that they are mine. They honor me with their lips. They believe in God. They believe in faith. They believe in religion. He says, but their hearts are far from me. Their hearts are far from me. They don't love me. They're not obeying me. They're not following me. They're not walking with me. They give me lip service. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules Learned by rote. So the Word of God is not enough. The Word of God is not sufficient. And we need new prophets, new pastors, new teachers to have new revelations and new teachings and new ideas and new doctrines to give us something that we can hold on to and be motivated to to love God and follow God according to man-made rules. But God has given us His Word. He's given us His way. He's revealed Himself through Scripture. He's revealed Himself through Jesus Christ. And we know the way. He says, Israel is full of silver and gold. There's no end to its treasures. Their land is full of war horses. And there is no end to its chariots. I told you they were living in this second golden age. They had wealth. They had military might. But Isaiah was saying, your wealth can't save you. Your military might can't save you. You may think you're a great nation because your economy is doing great. You may think you're a great nation because you have great military power. But God is saying, no, you're not a great nation. Because you've turned away from me. Idols can't say. Idols can't say their land is full of idols. An idol is when we turn to something in creation to replace God. You see, God provides for us. And in idolatry, people look in the pagan idolatry to the wind and the rain, the mountains, the stars, the moon, to provide safety and good crops and fertility and protection and those things. They're looking to the things of creation, whether it be in, like I said, the the stars and the moons or in the earth and the rocks and the mountains to provide for them, to protect them. They look to the spirits of the dead. They look to the spirits of this world. To what? To give them guidance and wisdom and to 
and to protect them and to provide for them. That's idolatry. We can look to money, wealth, power, fame, um, control in our own lives to replace God in providing, protecting, and guiding us. It says in Isaiah 8, 19, Someone may say to you, let's ask the mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead. This is alive and well in America today. Of course, the religion of spiritism began in a kind of formal way back in the 1800s in America. It's always been around. It's here today. We've had people on TV who have TV shows, popular TV shows, who say they can talk to your dead ancestors. And those dead ancestors can give you guidance. But the spirits can't save you. The Bible says have nothing to do with mediums and witchcraft and spiritism and those things. Why? Because there's a false spirit. There's an evil spirit behind those things. It's not God's way. With their whisperings and mutterings, they will tell us what to do. And now today you can go online, on your phone, on your computer, on your TV... And you can have a fortune teller, a medium, a spirit right there with you. You can click on a button and give them some money and they'll tell you. They'll whisper to you. They'll mutter to you. They'll turn the cards for you to tell you what to do. It's a trap. They can't save you. They're going to bring judgment. He continues, shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Should the living seek guidance from the dead? Of course not. The people will not turn, so judgment is coming. He says, therefore, in a single day, the Lord will destroy both the head and the tail. The noble palm branch and the lowly reed. I mean, the judgment's coming on the nation, on the people, the high and the low, the leaders and the people, because they've turned away from God. The leaders of Israel are the head, and the lying prophets are the tail. For the leaders of the people have misled them. They have led them down the path of destruction. So the question is, who are you following? Who are you following in the issues of the day? Are you following the politicians and the pundits, the teachers of, of, um, of godlessness? Or are you looking to God and His Word to be faithful to God? That is why the Lord takes no pleasure in the young men and shows no mercy even to the widows and the orphans. Judgments is coming on the nation. Why? Because they have all sinned. For they are all wicked hypocrites and they all speak foolishness. It's not just rich people who sin. Poor people sin too. You know that? We know that people can be victimized, but people of all socioeconomic classes sin and do evil. It's not something that's just for one class, but sin transcends and judgment transcends. But even then, the Lord's anger will not be satisfied. His fist is still poised to strike. They're saying judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. The people follow their corrupt and ungodly leaders rather than following God and the covenant that He has made with them. In Isaiah 2, 11 to 12, it says, Human pride will be brought down. I don't know what is celebrated more in America today than pride. Pride, pride, pride. Pride. It may be the most celebrated virtue in America. It's like nothing is greater than being proud. You realize that? Across the spectrum, Americans celebrate pride. Not just LGBTQ, but across the spectrum, across the political spectrum. People celebrate pride. Their own greatness, their own superiority. But the Bible says, the prophet says, human pride will be brought down. 
You say, why is this happening? Oh, it's his fault. It's their fault. It's the enemy's fault. God says, no, you're coming down because of your pride. Human pride will be brought down. Believe it. God says it. Human arrogance will be humbled. Only the Lord will be exalted. On the day of judgment. Don't put your trust in those who exalt themselves, and those who profess to their own superiority, and those who are filled with pride. You know, we live by our own rules. Even those who identify as Christians and profess to believe in Jesus Christ live by their own rules. We think we live in this land where everyone can make up their own rules. Why? Because we're good people and we can choose and we can decide what's good and bad, what's right and wrong, what's good for me and what's right for me. That's the mentality. That's the ethic in America. In verse 12, he says, For the Lord of heaven's armies has a day of reckoning. He will punish the proud and mighty and bring down everything that is exalted. You can be in a very humble place financially or socially and still be full of pride. You can be in a very high place and be full of pride. But the pride is coming down before God. There is a day of reckoning. We are like Israel, experiencing the consequences of our own sin in our land. We're experiencing the judgment that comes upon sin. Think about the Ten Commandments, okay? You know it's legal to violate the Ten Commandments. doesn't mean it's right, but it's legal. What's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before you. It is legal to violate the first commandment. What's the second commandment? You shall not make any graven images, no idols. You can violate legally the second commandment. What's the third commandment? Do not take God's name in vain. You can legally violate the third commandment. What's the fourth commandment? Keep the Sabbath. Now the Sabbath rules were not carried over into the New Testament, but you can violate any Sabbath rule or day of the Lord rule or uh, worshiping Jesus Christ on the resurrection day. What's the fifth rule? Honor your mother and father. You can violate that commandment in America all day long. What's the next commandment? Do not murder. Well, it all depends on who you're murdering and who you're killing. You can certainly kill children in the womb, right? It all depends on the law. So there's a, a mix there. The next one, do not commit adultery. There's no law against that. We got rid of that a long time ago. You see? You understand? Do not steal. Well, again, there's laws against stealing, but then there are times you can steal. The next one, do not law, lie. Do not bear false witness. Well, you know you can lie. Now, if you're in court under a, you know, an oath, it's illegal to lie. But if you're just talking on TV, if you're just talking on the on the uh, stump, if you're just talking with friends or in the media, you can say whatever you want. There's no law against lying. The tenth one, do not covet your neighbor's possessions. You can covet all you want in America. You understand? Do you understand? America does not embrace the law of God as a people. So we have to think of ourselves like Israel and Judah who has turned away from God and the prophet is speaking to us to turn back to God because God wants to save you individually but also us as a people. So much of the poverty, the dysfunction and the suffering that we see is due to our rejection of God's will. Sin has consequences. One of the most important areas in which this has occurred is with the family. 
is with the family. God had a design for the family. He created Adam and Eve, male and female. He created the, them as a husband and a wife who would become a mother and a father. And through the father and the mother, children would be conceived and born and brought into this world. And it would be the duty and the obligation of the father and the mother to raise those children according to the guidance of God, according to God's ways. But we've rejected God's design for family. And it didn't just begin in the last few years with LGBTQ. It began decades ago. Because decades ago, Americans rejected marriage. When they embrace no-fault divorce, you can commit adultery, that's okay. You can turn away from your spouse, that's okay. When Americans rejected sexual fidelity, you can have sex with whomever you want, whenever you want, as long as you have consent. It doesn't matter. It's okay. You see, we rejected that. We rejected husband, wife, father, mother, and children together, and that has been rejected. The consequences have been heavy upon our nation. Fatherlessness is an epidemic. We know today, socially, statistically, that children who grow up without a father in their home, in their life, are at much greater risk to horrible and difficult outcomes in their lives. This began decades ago. And but we're reaping what we sowed then today in our own nation. And now we've come to the point where parents can intentionally deprive their children of their mother or their father. God's design was that we have a father and mother. And did you know that every person born in the world has a father and a mother? You can't have a person without a father and a mother. That's the way God made it. You've got to have the sperm and the egg to conceive the child. You can't have just a sperm or just an egg. you got to have both. Why? Because God made us that way. But today, people are intentionally depriving children of a father or mother in order to fulfill their own desire, their own way. So you have single women who want to have a child but not a husband. And so they get sperm from somebody so they can have a child. And they intentionally raise their child without their father. We have couples today, homosexual couples, lesbian couples, who intentionally decide that we're going to have a son or a daughter and we're going to deprive that son or daughter of his or her mother. We're going to have a son or a daughter and we're going to intentionally deprive that son or daughter of his or her father. Yes, they have a father. Yes, they have a mother. But they will never know that father. They will never know that mother. Because we want to do it our way. Our way. We should learn the lesson of the last 40, 50 years as we've turned away from God's design for family and seen the harm that it has brought to our society. God warns because He wants to save us. Judgment is coming now in the future and in the end. Isaiah 24, 5 to 6 says, "The, uh, The earth suffers for the sins of its people, for they have twisted God's instructions, violated His laws, and broken His everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must pay the price for their sin. They are destroyed by fire, and only a few are left alive. God wants to save us from the curse of sin. Sin is like a cancer. Cancer is deadly. Cancer kills. Cancer is dangerous. Those cells begin growing in your body and you don't even know they're there. You don't even realize they're growing. But they grow and they multiply over time until they begin to wreak havoc in your body, affecting your bodily functions and systems, until eventually that cancer can take your life. 
Sin is the same way. It may begin small and in unnoticeable ways, but as it grows and multiplies, it begins to bring devastation and destruction on the systems of our lives, our families, our people. And in the end, it brings death and destruction. God warns because He wants to save. God sent the prophets to warn of judgment. Why? Because He wanted to save the people. He wanted to save the people. He says, come now, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Sin is a deadly disease like cancer, but do you know what? It can be healed. It can be healed when you have the right physician who knows the cure and can perform the operation to heal you and to save you. So after God pronounces this judgment on Israel in chapter 1, we come down to verse 18. He says, Come now, let us settle this. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. I will heal you. I will cleanse you. I will forgive you. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you'll be devoured by the sword of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. God will save. That's the good news. God will save. You say, man, all this judgment, all this negativity, why is God doing that? Because God wants to save you. God wants to save us. And He knows that sin always leads us down the path of suffering, death, and destruction. And He doesn't want us to go there. He doesn't want you to go there. God will save. In Isaiah 1, 27 28, it says, Zion will be restored by justice. Those who repent will be revived by righteousness. God brings His justice to restore His people. The people of Israel, but the people of all the world through Christ. And when we repent, we're given new life, eternal life. Not by our righteousness, but by the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He says, but rebels and sinners will be completely destroyed, and those who desert the Lord will will be consumed. That's why the warning comes. Because He sees what lies ahead. He sees what we deny and knows that it's real. In Isaiah 2, 2 2-3, it says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. He's speaking to the end of time. The end of the ages. He says it will be raised above the other hills. And people from all over the world will stream there to worship. You see, in the Old Testament it says that in the end, people from all the world, all ethnicities, all nations, all peoples will come together to worship the Lord their God. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. So I ask you, why wait Do it today. Today, decide in your heart, I am coming to worship God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of history, the God of creation. There He will teach us His ways, and we will walk in His paths, for the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem to all the world. Even Assyria and Egypt. Listen to what it says here in Isaiah 19. And this is the end of this section talking about Egypt and Assyria. But he says this, In that day, 
Israel will be third, along with Egypt and Assyria. Now listen to this. A blessing in the midst of the earth. And look what he says next. For the Lord of heaven's armies will, be, will say, Blessed be who? Egypt. And who's Egypt? My people. You see that? Blessed be Assyria. Who is Assyria? The land I have made. And blessed be Israel, my special possession. You see, God's plan is to bring all people back to himself. All people to bring you back to himself. That's the plan of God. It was revealed in the Old Testament. It's revealed in the New Testament. Most clearly seen, of course, in Jesus Christ. And a king will establish this new order. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and his peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for when? For all eternity. So we know this is in the end. This is not now. This is in the end when Christ rules on the throne in the new heaven and the new earth. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. One thing you can be sure of is what God says will happen will happen. Judgment will come and salvation will come. So as we bring this message to a close, I want you to know that God wants to save you. He wants to save you out of difficulties right now in your life. You may be a Christian and going through difficult times and God wants to deliver you from them. Sometimes, yes, we know He delivers us through them. But the key is that we trust God, we obey God, we walk with God in all things. You may be watching today or here today listening and, and you know you've never come to that place of repentance and faith in God. You've heard about it. Maybe you identify because of your family, your heritage, the nation, or whatever, but you know that in your own heart, personally, you've never made that step of faith. So right now, I call on you as, as we pray. We're going to pray in just a moment. I call on you according to the Word of God, according to what we read in Isaiah, to turn, to repent, to turn to God, to ask for His forgiveness, to be forgiven, and to be restored beginning a new life in Christ. If you're ready to make that step right now, just bow with me in prayer and bef come before God and say, God, I know I've sinned. And just ask God, God, forgive me of my sins. And when you ask God to forgive you, He will forgive you. And place your faith in Jesus Christ because Jesus was the righteousness of God, the justice of God that makes it possible for you to be forgiven. Why? Because He paid your penalty for you. He paid your sentence for you. He paid your debt for you. So embrace Jesus Christ by faith. His death as the penalty for your sin, the payment of that penalty for your sin. His resurrection is resurrection that conquers sin and death and gives you eternal life. And by faith receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And when you do that, you repent of sin and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Then you're saved. You're redeemed. And you begin a new life of walking with God. Say, God, thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that, it's the beginning of a new life and God wants you not to be an orphan. He wants you to be a part of the family, the family of God. And we invite you to come be a part of Gateway Church where you can be a part of the family here at Gateway to know, to grow, to develop, to live together as God's family in Christ. Let's sing together. Jesus, we love you.